Although I do come at my relationships from an endemically polyamorous point of view. Nonetheless, I lived a big chunk of my life in the monogamous mindset, in monogamous relationships. They're no less hard. But the hard that I had, that I remember from those relationships didn't go anywhere. It was just always hard. These hard things lead to something new every time. Every time something hard comes up, when it's resolved, there's something new there. It's very creative. And I love that. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy. Well, welcome to episode 294. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have an amazing conversation with Jolie and Ken. Jolie is a relationship coach and sexuality educator, and she and Ken host the podcast Playing With Fire. Yeah, I think you left off a few credentials. Oh, all, just a few. <laughs> all around badasses. <laughs> yes. This this conversation is is so wonderful. I think one of the things that I loved about it so much was not only are Julie and Ken super vulnerable about sort of all of the, we'll call them learning experiences that they've had along the way, but over time, they've really developed a lot of skills and, and Julie's done a ton of schooling to really understand this better. Mm-hmm. And so then they can go back in time and pick apart what was happening for them with with sort of the hindsight and all of the knowledge they have now. And so it's a really, really great conversation that I'm just, I'm super excited to get out there. Yeah. They've been together 14 years and have had quite a few ups and downs. Yeah. And if you, <laughs> and and I highly recommend heading over to Julie's website, which links will be in the show notes, but it's JulieHamilton.com. And again, so, so will links to their podcast, Playing With Fire. But one of the things that she has on her website that I loved was talking about how she said she made every mistake possible when she first started opening up to non-monogamy. Mm-hmm. And also so how so much of that was because she was alone and didn't have community around her. And so we talk a bit about community today, but we also just have a wonderful, fun, amazing conversation. Yeah, with, have bo- we, have with we both talk- of them. Have we talked about how it's amazing? <laughs> yeah, with both of them. Yeah, no, this Ken is no slouch when it comes to relationship <laughs> wisdom either. That is not to discount his knowledge in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, and also we wanted just to say a quick shout out to Marie, who is on episode Focus Fridays, episode 2.5, back in March 2022. Marie actually introduced us to Jolie. So. And, and some of you may have heard Marie talking uh, late recently on Dan Savage. Yes, she was just on Dan Savage like a week or two ago. But we had her first. <laughs> anyway, congratulations, Marie, and thank you for putting us in touch with Jolie. And with that, for anyone who's a premium subscriber, we're going to jump right into the interview now. And for anyone else, we have a couple of announcements. Fun announcements, Emma. Fun announcements. Always fun. First up. If you're not familiar with a premium subscription, it's a way to skip all of these announcements up front. Don't worry, you still get important dates in the outro. But to sign up for as little as a couple bucks a year, you can go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, scroll down on the homepage, and you'll see links right there. And what's fun about that? What's fun about signing up? These were supposed to be fun announcements. (laughs) Fun announcements. You get to you get to skip these announcements. <laughs> All right, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. The fun part is you get to scroll on our homepage. Yeah, get to see all the goodies there. Photos, and mm-hmm. I put a topless photo of myself towards the bottom. And you could also like check out the shirts that are listed there. You get to see those out. All right. Next up, (laughs) our virtual community. First of all, a huge shout out and thank you to the almost 300 members who have made up this community. Actually, Emma was just telling me four years. Four years ago. Yes. We started the community four years ago. It has grown. It has shifted. It has morphed. It has evolved. And we're super excited about it. So thank you to everybody who is a part of it. If you're out there looking for people like you, maybe you don't want to be alone and make all of the mistakes that Jolie made. <laughs> or us, by Or the way. us, yeah, well, <laughs> let's not talk about that. <laughs> we highly recommend you check out the community. It's a place for support. It's also a place for friendship and just about anything you could ever imagine. 
These people are amazing. So check it out on our homepage. Well, not on our homepage, on our website. Click on the community tab and you will see links there to sign up and join us. The community is five bucks a month and you get access to an online support community as well as monthly Q&As and a monthly men's group and women's group. We also have weekly support groups that we're launching. We've actually launched, I launched these back in October for the men's group, a weekly men's group. And you're about to kick off a weekly women's group. Yes. Actually, when this publishes, our first call was yesterday. Oh, boy. But you, <laughs> but don't miss out. You can still join. Yes. There's there's definitely room to join, and we'll be meeting every Tuesday. Uh, if you're wanting to find out more information, go to our website. Click on the community tab. You'll see a little uh, tab there for weekly groups. All of the information you'll need is there. We would love to have you join us. These are going to be much more intimate groups, and we're really excited about them. The weekly group for Finn has been amazing, and I'm really excited to see what this weekly women's group is like. Yeah, and just a quick note, too, on the weekly men's group. And, uh, well, first, let's start there. So we the weekly men's group that I have currently open is just about full. We actually can't take any more members. We try to keep them small. But if you go to the website and on that page where you sign up, that is basically a form to let us know you're interested. And we're sort of creating a wait list for an additional men's group and a gender inclusive group. And we already have a couple of people signed up. So we're partway there. If you are looking for this type of maybe a little more intense uh intense support community support peer support yes please check it out please sign up let us know you're interested and we'll get the next cohort running we're just kind of waiting until we have enough people yes and last but not least but not least our <laughs> favorite way and the way that m and i get tested for stis stdcheck.com you've been practicing <laughs> i've been practicing i hear her out i hear her <laughs> In the closet, just <laughs> slowing down, saying it slow. Anyway, this is the way that M and I get tested for STIs. We've used this service for years. We absolutely love it. And if you use the links on our website, you get to save 10%, which brings the cost of a 10 panel test down to $129. It also helps support the show financially, which we are eternally grateful to all of you who do that. Thank you. You help put food on our table. You do. And Thank pay you. our rent. Yes. We appreciate it. But we're not just telling you that because we make some money. We're telling you because it's an incredible service. And we highly recommend you be informed and up to date about your sexual health status so you can communicate that to anybody who you might be enjoying time with. Yes. And by that, we mean... Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> You fill in the blanks. Uh, last but not least, Hold I already on. said that for this. What? Really quick, just to tell them where they can find those links. Go for it. You go to our website. You either click on the resources tab or you – the resources tab. That's a delicious tab. You click on the resources tab or you click on the podcast tab and you go to the show notes for any one of our episodes. There are links in there or in your podcast player show notes. I'm going to go get some Reese's while you talk about this last part. Well, I was about to say last but not least, but I realized I said that for STD check. And now I'm saying it again because don't forget to reach out to us. Send us a voicemail. Send us an email. We'd love to hear from you if you want to be on the podcast or if you have any questions, comments, thoughts. We would just love to hear from you. We would. And with that, let's head over and talk to Jolie and Ken, and we'll see you all in roughly one hour. Let's go. Welcome, welcome to the podcast, Jolie and Ken. We are thrilled to talk to you today and learn all about you too. But before we do, can you jump in and introduce yourselves for anybody who is not familiar with the two of you? I am Jolie Hamilton. Um, I am, so I have a doctorate. So a lot of places people introduce me as Dr. Jolie Hamilton, but I actually don't really care for that. Um, but if you know me, that's why you would know me because that I get splashed around the internet a little bit, mostly for my jealousy research and because um, I talk a lot other than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ken Hamilton. I'm you talk a little less. I talk a little <laughs> less, um, and much less of what I talk about is doctorate level. <laughs> or, no, it's just more. It's just less recorded. Okay. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> and, um, um, co-host of our podcast, Playing with Fire. Wonderful, yes. love it. And to start things off, maybe can we hear a little bit about what the relationship dynamic between the two of you, and maybe anybody else that that orbits around you too, or that you orbit around, what is what does that look like today? And then we're going to rewind it back to somewhere and figure out how we got here. 
Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do the today, and then and then oh, you can no. lead off with. <laughs> All right. <Go> <laughs> so Ken and I are are in what I think could best be described by saying like it is descriptively looks like a hierarchy, a hierarchical situation because we, ha we share seven children. Um, so it would be hard to not have it look a certain way. We also own a home together and we, I, I run a business and Ken participates in aspects of that business. And so we have this home life that has this very cis het mono looking exterior, like the, uh, the dull version, like that dull light tan M&M &M that they used to make that just didn't, like, they didn't even keep making it. Bummer. Um, that's not how we are on the inside. Our, the rest of our life is a complicated mess of, um, I date quite a lot. Um, none of my partners are people who would, I would necessarily name, um, because I wind up dating a lot of people who are not out, which is a real, interesting part of my personal story because I'm very out and exceptionally public with my life. And so, yeah, it's a little complicated. And Ken is I date currently, a little less. <laughs> yeah, he's a little, a little shyer of the dating process than I am. I'm more overwhelmed by life than you are. Yeah, in I don't, general. I don't grasp quite as much of it at a time, but I do date. But we both, we, we date independently. We date together occasionally when that like just happens to line up. But it's been, it's been years oh, it's now been since, time now. yeah, many years yeah. now since it's actually happened. I mean, that's fun, but like, I, it's not something you can, I don't think you can look for it. It's just a happy accident. And, um, the constellation that I feel like I'm most part of is one of a lot of comets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like my solar system is a lot of comets. And I think that it has a little something to do with being a mom of many teenagers and very, very busy human and really liking other busy humans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. So yeah, lots of people, but they're like inter, like there's a lot of intermittent connection. And I also like really deep con connections. So then they tend to last a long time. So they're like long lasting, but less frequent in. Yeah. I think it's going to change, though. The youngest kid turned 16 yesterday. So I think things are shifting because I'm noticing my relationships are shifting a little bit. And your dating is shifting a little bit because yeah. there's just more space and time. Yeah. yeah. Well, when the youngest one is 16, the kids don't need isn't the right word. Want us around. Is <laughs> <laughs> well, there's more space. That's it. That's it. It's the one. They don't want us around that much. <laughs> <laughs> Which is bittersweet. Yeah. It yeah. is. Sure. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It, I mean, they're between 16 and 24, and there's seven of them. So we are also, it's fine. It, it's, we're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's been a lot of parenting. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> you're used to this part. This is the seventh time you've done it. You're, you're... Exactly. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Uh, and how long have you two been together? 14 years together in, yeah. so, in this form. But I've known Ken since my mother was pregnant with me. Wow. So, so that's a weird part of the story. Yep. So if we're going to go in the way back machine. Goes, yeah. 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 The, the, the story is that we met in person when he and my eldest cousin used me as a, an actual football when I was about a year old playing a football game with a baby. Literally using me as a football. We weren't good children. Um, <laughs> could you could you imagine how many degrees she would have if you hadn't done that, Ken? Right? <laughs> Think about it. I don't remember ever dropping you. <laughs> yeah, but my cousins weren't as agile as you were. That's accurate. <laughs> so we've known each other our whole lives, but we've been in, in a romantic or intimate connection for about 14 years. And mm -hmm. then before that, another seven years of being close friends, very close, close friends. Close community. Um, community, we, we were homeschooling our children a mile apart from each other. So in close connection all the time. So it's a really, a very interwoven adulthood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. I want to, I would love to go back to when non-monogamy maybe came into each of your lives respectively. But bef before that, do you mind, Jolie, just sort of defining a comet partnership just for anybody who's not super familiar. And also, cause I think that probably means something different to everybody and at least a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so I like the the term comet because comets are special mm -hmm. and they're, you know, they're these celestial objects that I remember looking at when I was a child, looking forward to seeing a comet. And so comets are people who are in my life who we've committed to staying in each other's lives, but we have 
intentionally decided not to put a prescription on when we will see each other next and instead allow things to flow sort of organically into the next time. And so some of those people I see on a more or less regular basis, like, oh, I come into town about once a year, usually around June. Awesome. Yay. Let's see each other then. And some of them are people who yeah, we might not see each other for several months or even a few years if there happens to be a pandemic. Um, and <laughs> then all of a sudden, there they are again. And it's not for lack of want to spend time with them, but really a matter of uh, just an acknowledgement of how complex our lives are, mm -hmm. that allowing for this, this level of depth and connection to endure without the pressure of we have to be something particular. We, we really take things all the way off this idea that it has to be on the relationship escalator, things have to just keep progressing at a certain level. So mm -hmm. my comments are people who I, I know I could always call any of them and they would pick up the phone and they'd be like, yes, what mm -hmm. is going on? But I probably don't very often unless mm -hmm. we're looking to get together. Yeah. I love that. And I think what's amazing about it is the, what I sort of took away from that is the idea that when you do come into town, that you you sort of, I don't want to say you expect it, but you're planning on it. You're looking forward to it. You're going to make some effort to make it happen. It's not, oh, hey, you, you message them three days later, like, oh, I was just in Houston. And they're like, well, well what the hell? You right. know, it's, it's, hey, I'm coming to Houston in three weeks. Can I see you? What yes. do we need to do to make that happen? Exactly. And occasionally it's, hey, I'm, I'm, I, I, I could afford plane tickets right now. So, yeah could I make this happen without, you know, when would work for you? And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it, for me, it ups the specialness level. And because I did my graduate degrees in California and I live in Massachusetts, I also experienced like a lot of time when I was going to California. So it made sense to have this sort of home base there, but I wasn't there that frequently. It was only four times a year. So right. I, that also sort of built up space for there to be this, this comet energy in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what's amazing about it too, is that it's, they're not any maybe less important or less deep, right? You maybe that weekend is like the most intense, crazy connected weekend. And then you say goodbye and you say, I'll see you in some amount of time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then you, you keep that going without, like you said, without the pressure, without the expectation. And I, I think that's a beautiful way to relate. And I, the thing I actually love about it, even though it feels really weird to me even to say it, is without even the pressure to text and like keep up with each other, we just don't. Um, you know, I, I, I love that because it allows me to really enjoy them when we're in space together. And yeah, there might be the occasional check-in, but mostly no we're we're letting the relationship exist as it fits in each of our lives and there's something really like sweet just like really really sweet about that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well, it takes some pressure off yeah yeah for sure <laughs> i love it i love it so when did when did the idea the concept or even the practice of non-monogamy come into sort of each of your lives um i i don't remember a time when I didn't think that having more romantic relationships or sexual relationships was better. It wasn't, wasn't better. I th I've always thought that. Um, but I wasn't raised and I didn't live in a community that agreed with me. Or so, gave you language. Or gave me language. Absolutely. Um, so I just had my private thoughts and and practices very not non-monogamous practices without having even the word non-monogamy behind it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most interesting thing. Like, like just existing in yeah. a, yep. in a, like a state of being non-monogamous without even using the word because monogamy was so baked into the melu right. that you didn't I mean, call it out necessarily. I was a fairly defiant rebellious. Isn't the right word because I kind of, I'd fit in. But I didn't agree with anybody. I thought they were all idiots. <laughs> <laughs> he was so, well known for thinking so, everyone was an know, idiot. <laughs> I, I knew better anyway. It's like, oh, I don't know why everybody's doing it this way, but um, okay. I guess I'll figure it out as I go. Um, but also fairly antisocial, so I didn't really do very much about that fact. And then the first time I got married and um, my wife and I were, um, 
I was going to say fooling around. That's how my father always I mean, that put is, it. I think that's a good way. <laughs> fooling around. Fooling around. Um, we, uh, we had sex with some other people, and she wanted to continue the relationship with uh, her partner, and I, was, I, I didn't want to continue and was fine with that. Um, but again, no language, no discussions beyond, um, well, I think I want to do this. And I say, okay. And that was pretty much it until <laughs> a couple of years later when I didn't like the way it was going, but instead of having like a nuanced conversation about what wasn't working for me, I asked for the completely wrong thing and said, so I think I'd like you to, uh, would you stop sleeping with him? And she said, sure. She didn't. But mm -hmm. that's what I asked for. And the thing is, it didn't even matter. That wasn't the thing that mattered to me. What mattered to me was I was coming home and I wanted to just shut down. I was having pretty long days at that point. I was going to work and then I was going for trainings for three or four hours a night. And I just wanted to come home and be done. But then there'd be somebody there uh, and somebody I liked. Uh, I mean, a lifelong friend. And I just didn't want, I like, oh, I want some more downtime. Didn't ask for that. Didn't ask for that at all. <laughs> um, so accidentally tried to control sex in place of the complicated right. conversation yep. about what you might've wanted. Cause again, no language, no language. And this is one of those situations where like, Oh, they're all idiots. Oh wait, I'm an idiot too. I just totally <laughs> played right into the, <laughs> the common, you know, the, the modern narrative to be fair, as though that was, was the, the most important thing. It was like the early nineties though. It was a while ago. It was a long yeah. time yeah. ago. Yeah. He's not the youngest guy. So I that's think 30 that's, years ago as right. now that you mentioned it. And there, was, so, there weren't the conversations There weren't the resources. Had. There weren't the conversations. So I don't know. So we did that. Um, and that was my first real practice of non-monogamy at a significant scale. But that word didn't come up. Mm -hmm. Well, but it sounds like you had also at some point had a conversation. I mean, you seemingly didn't just randomly end up fooling around with people. You're right. There there had to have been some conversation about how that got started. It seems you both opted in at that point. Yes, we did definitely both opt in. There was nobody. There was consent, no, there was consent <laughs> around all of that. And excitement, even, and excitement. from the sounds of yeah. it. And um, so we, we did that for, I don't know, maybe a year. And then... I was like, okay, that was fun. And she was like, hey, I want to keep going. Um, so, and, but still consent all the way, right up until I asked for the wrong thing. And she was like, okay, well, and true to the relationship we had, she said something that would make the current moment easier. Mm -hmm. And, and we just continued on like that. So that's what happened for me. Um, and then, and then soon after, um, we had kids, uh, and things started to get complicated and I kind of stopped thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So and she was still, she was still dating that person that whole time, but yes, kind of secretly. It sounds like secretly. It was, yep. it was the, it well, has to be the definition of don't ask. Is, <laughs> secret yeah, it, was is an, a it was an open secret. Um, I stopped looking. And it was an open secret. We all lived in the same it. neighborhood. It was, it was a, yeah. an open secret. Well, but it almost sounds like maybe you got what you had actually sought, which was to not yeah. come home and have this person in your living room. So at that level, I did get that. But <laughs> what I also got was a ruptured relationship with mm -hmm. that other person. And yeah. mm -hmm. I did that. I did not want that was, right. um, that what's, that's what comes of not having nuanced conversations about what you actually want and don't want. So cautionary tale there. That is the hardest part of that story. I think from my perspective. So I, I knew him during this time and I didn't know this was going on, but losing a friend because you're asking your, your partner not to sleep with them, like losing the friend. Yeah, it's hard to make a lifelong friend. Yeah, It's really hard. Like I hear that story now and I still like, it makes me, teary to think about the cost of yeah. a friendship when we don't know how to talk about how intimacy works and mm -hmm. like what we're actually needing sexually, romantically, whatever, all of the things. It's such a steep cost. It is. Well, and, and to build on that, who do you go talk to, right? It's not like you can turn to your other friends and be like, 
yeah, I asked him to stop sleeping with my wife and it didn't go well. And they're like, the what? You asked them to do what? <laughs> You did about? try to have that conversation with your brother. It didn't oh, seem like yeah. it went that well. No, that didn't go too well. <laughs> yeah. And my my in- introduction to non-monogamy was much more like a wrecking ball. I like full on swinging through the the, the brick wall. I um. So what I think is interesting about your nothing story subtle is at the very <laughs> beginning you you totally. I mean, wrecking ball. Yes. But it was a wrecking ball of consent. You were like, here's what's happening. <laughs> here's the whole. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, there was nothing. There was no soft entry. I was on a dance floor. I was dancing with someone. And um, it happens to be this person who I'm sitting next to. I was dancing with him. And I'd known him my whole life. Nothing occur- It did not occur to me that that would, be, that, that would matter. You're just dancing on a, literally on a dance floor. And all of a sudden, I w- it was like my entire world flipped upside down. It was like my soul left my body, and I was returned to my body with the full knowledge and awareness that I needed to have this human be intensely in my life. So in my naivete, I went home with my husband that night and like jumped in the shower with him at 2 o'clock in the morning after dance club. And I was like, oh my God, I have all these enormous feelings for Ken. I can't believe it. My husband did not take that as smoothly. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't see it. He didn't, even though we were all on the dance floor and he was dancing with people too. And there was like, you know, some, there was a little bit of making out happening. I'm sure here and there in corner, like, but for someone to have feelings, yeah, feelings, feelings, that's the scary word. That's the scary word. And so I didn't realize that I genuinely, I had always fallen in love with my friends so it didn't seem any like that big a deal. It, um, but Ken happens to own a penis and that made it different mm-hmm. because the people I'd fallen in love it's with up rental. until then. <laughs> tell you. Yeah. Oh, well, you make it work great. It's fine. <laughs> um, but because I had always fallen in love with, um, with cisgender women, my first husband was not threatened by that, but I didn't know that. So I just naively was like, Oh my God, I have all these feelings. Eek. And, um, it didn't land well. And 45 days later, we were separated. Wow. wow. But Ken was not. And so there I found myself in my first triad because he was married. And, and she was, was like, come on in. That Let's was a do really this. interesting experience because, yep. So she and I had already had this experience of an open relationship that then resolved at in some way. <laughs> well, cause her other partner got married to someone else, which, you know, that, clo- like, that did in fact, uh, end it. resolve that part of it. And, um, so it never occurred to me that there would be a problem with me having a relationship also. Turns out it was a pro- problem. <laughs> well, instead. yeah, but we didn't, not at first. Not, not at, it first. Wasn't there at first. There was, there was some time when it was, um, just kind of puzzling through it. But our entry was, it was a blooper reel. It really was mm-hmm. because I didn't have any language, but I love language. So I immediately started like grappling for like, how do I describe this? And what is this thing? And what's happening? And I'm in, I think I'm falling in love. I don't even think this is just feelings. I think I'm falling in love. What does that mm-hmm. mean? Can you even be in love with two people at one time? Like just by brains breaking. I was 32 years old at the time. Um, I had four biological children I was raising. Like I, my life was very, very full and I went to my friends. I was, I did exactly what you just suggested. I totally turned to my friends. And I was like, I, I don't know. Everybody, what should I do? Like, I'm in <laughs> love with these people. Love is good. Right. They, and again, they did not, they, they didn't think that that was necessarily great. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you got some mixed results. <laughs> mixed results at best, except And here is, I think, my favorite part about this story, your wife at the time. I sat with her in my own backyard, and I was like, I am in love with your husband. I have no idea what to do. And she was like, that's fine. We've done this before. Not a problem. I got you. And to her credit, like really gave it a real honest gotcha. I mean, we were together for two and a half years, all of us. Like really did give it a full shot um, and really meant... Like I meant the world to me that she was so there for that right at the beginning. She's like, feelings happen. Mm -hmm. And this is just like, yep, we're just going to figure this out. 
there's so much more to the story, but that moment right there, I think is one of my favorite moments in all of our polyamorous adventures. What's interesting is, is that's your moment. I never had that moment, not even like with her, because then she and I would have these other conversations, um, separate. So it's very, um, complicated situation, but it, it, we did, we worked on it for a while. Well, we wound up buying a house all together and moving in together and raising our children together and all the kids. Yeah. With all the kids and five cats. It was insane. (laughs) And with with seven kids and five cats, like that's not, that's that's not reasonable. And three adults (laughs) and three adults. Yeah. Very little support. And that, yeah. And and we didn't even know where to go. I mean, you, you found what you could for books. Uh, um, and what, I, I, this was, you said about 14 2009. Years ago? Okay. Two th- yeah. So 2009, 2010, the, it started in nine. The, the year of 2010 was the year of my, um, intense internet research that turned up that in fact, we didn't have the resources we needed yet. I mean, if mm-hmm. we go and look at the big resource dumps that finally happened, like, yep, that's like five, six years later. Mm-hmm. So we were, on our own. It's, it is literally why I decided to study psychology. It's why I have multiple psychology degrees is, I don't know, but so I got to figure this out. So I was like, it probably has something to do with how our brains and hearts work. I'll try psychology. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I, I just a couple of questions maybe to Clara. So it, it you had said, Jolie, that you fell in love. You would fall in love with your friends and you also said that like there was maybe some making out at the club was the relationship you had with your husband. It sounds like it wasn't a strictly closed, like neat little box where everybody was on the outside and it was you two versus the world. It sounds like there was some gray area, but falling in love and having feelings for another penis owner or penis renter, not, ex- <laughs> not acceptable. Okay. Or it didn't so work it, for her ex-husband. Yeah. yeah, it did not work for him. And to his credit, I think it's really important for people to know what doesn't work for them. But, mm-hmm. you know, you say a gray, zer- gray zone and I would say, nope. I absolutely knew that I was monogamous. I knew that I was in a monogamous relationship. I knew that when I we were engaged, I got engaged when I was 17. So I, like he was my high school sweetheart. I did. I cheated twice while I was in college when I was 18. And so I knew that that was a violation of our uh, agreement. Um, I knew that touching was not allowed. Like I knew all the parameters, even though we didn't have tons of like agreements, anything Mm -hmm. I would call an explicit agreement. I knew. However, um, fantasy, imagination, and feelings for women were completely encouraged. So there was like a lot of clarity around like you behave as a monogamous person, but he knew I was bisexual. I was out from the time I was a child. And so, and I hear this story a lot. I hear it when I collect my data for my jealousy Mm -hmm. studies, where I hear people saying like, well, you're bi. So, you know, you might at some point want to, and it's like, there's this like asterisk after people's monogamy a lot of times where they're like, well, but if you're bi and that's the kind of, if there, if there were to be a gray zone, I think it would be in that, Mm -hmm. except there were no actions. So when I say there were people like making out in corners and stuff, this was just what happens. Okay. So I'm going to add another piece of the puzzle. I had just opened a CrossFit gym. Now I have, I've opened two CrossFit gyms in my life and, um, I known a lot of CrossFit gym owners most of them are not married to the people who they were married to when they first opened their CrossFit gyms. So we had just opened a CrossFit gym and, um, yeah, our marriage did not last the year. There was a lot of change happening in that year. And I don't think it's fair actually to say that it has anything to do with the non-monogamy. I think it had a lot to do with spending time in a physically intimate environment, um, getting comfortable with my body, being in spaces where I was finally in spaces with other people who were not just at home raising children, nurse, breastfeeding for le- the last decade. I think that the parameters of my marriage were very clear. Mm-hmm. I was definitely in violation of them. However, I don't regret at all leaving that plain gray box. Yeah. It mm-hmm. didn't work. Mm-hmm. 
Totally. Yeah. Totally. And and I I think too just to shine a light on too the the transition from that partnership ending forty five days after you announced your feelings to that's fast. Then you're fast. sort then you're sort of in a triad. Then you're moved in. Then like there's a lot happening in your life at a very like that's that's a lot of change for anybody to process. It was. I, now, now I look back. So now I'm, I, you know, I'm trained in neurosomatic intelligence and I have a doctorate in psychology and I'm like, oh, I was in a lot of trauma. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so were my kids. Like, so like I didn't realize at the time what was happening. And then during that time, during the two and a half years of the triad, my mother died. Um, and she was my only real source of like solid support. Like she was the one who was like, I don't know what's happening here but I love you. So we'll, I don't know. Okay. So the number of things that happened in those first couple years are so unbelievably stressful, like so much stress, including losing our, my whole community. Um, mm-hmm. because I, what happened when, when I announced my feelings was, um, my community, many of them, it turned out have been swinging <laughs> many of them, if not all of them. And they all abandoned, my, not just me, but my children. Wow. wow. That was hard. In the name of, oh, but we don't have feelings and we don't leave our partners. <sighs> this is yeah. one of my soapboxes that I, I anybody, <laughs> uh-huh. anybody who's listened to us enough, they're like, I, they know what I'm going to say, which is the, that swinging trope. And it, I have nothing against swinging. We did it for, we did it for over a decade. And no, I, I still love that world even. It I, is. Uh, yeah. But to say we don't we don't have feelings. We don't get feelings. Like yeah, you sure you don't until you right. do. And I think what I often say is th- at least have the thought experiment even for yourself. Right. Ideally with your partner to say, "Hey, we're going down this road." You I mean, you just outlined it for a CrossFit gym. Right. You, I was going to say sure. that conversation needs to happen whether you're open mm-hmm. in any sort of way or not. Yep. Right. Like yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Even if yeah. you're in a monogamous relationship, doesn't mean that you will never encounter feelings for anyone else out in the world. Exactly. Yeah. And and I didn't know. I genuinely thought every single day from the first moment when I had what I describe as my numinous moment where I was like, oh my God, I want to spend more time with this person. Mind you, I did not have sex with him. It, that was months, mm-hmm. months before that happened. I was divorced. Um, but I... I knew I wanted to to know this person more intimately. And I truly thought that if I just told everyone the truth, if I just kept saying what was true about my feelings, that even if they were hard, we could all find a way forward. We could all reinvent. We could adjust. We could support each other. And um, my wanting to be honest, yeah, it completely ostracized my me from my community, just 100%. And... I could have handled that, but it was brutal to do to my children who were, they were two, five, seven, and 10. Yeah. Not okay. And while all this was happening, I was continuing my, my, my trend of everybody's idiots and I know what's good. And so <laughs> I just, and as a result, what I did was basically nothing. I just stood there and waited for the world to rearrange around me. Meanwhile, so you're getting hurt. The kids are getting hurt. So he supported me and 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 his wife supported me. And our kids all were, they'd known each other their whole lives. So they were all like together and, and forming a little tribe of their own. So but, from the adult point of view, practically everything was being held up pretty well. But the relational, mm-hmm. emotional part of it yeah. was... Um, was not good. Miss, I would not missing, that yeah. Again. Missing. Yeah. Missing. And mostly yeah. because of a misunderstanding about what it means to have intimacy with yeah. other adults. Yeah, Well, right. And that's, that's what I was going to say. It's like you two and your um, ex-wife, like we're doing the best you could in that moment. Like you, really you were. And even your ex-husband too. Like you were yeah. all doing the best you knew how to do. Yeah, but, absolutely. And, and so there's has to be grace there. And you can hold space for and we wish it would have been a little different. We wish we would have done things a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, can I can I ask on that? Because I think we're, we have the privilege of talking to people who are well-versed, educated, spent a lot of time researching this. Like looking back at that, you said, you know, I just thought if I told everybody and I was open and honest that, that yeah. people would get behind this, they would understand it, it would. And it really... 
sounds like it blew up in your face, but I, I also hear so many people saying, I don't want to hide. Yeah. I don't want to go back in that box. I want to be me. And you sort of just laid out a really scary end result that can happen from that. So I maybe mean, how would you do it different? And what are your thoughts for somebody who is sitting there going, I'll be damned if you're going to put me back in a closet? Yeah. Okay. So first, one of the reasons I am out so loudly now um, is because I have the privilege of doing so. And so I will continue being loud on, on the behalf of anyone who feels like they have to protect themselves. I will keep being loud for you. The, the price of, <laughs> of all that honesty w- was high. I wouldn't actually change it mm-hmm. except mm-hmm. for where my children were hurt. I wouldn't change it. And the thing is, I can't change that for them. I can't change the fact that other adults were willing to do harmful things to children because they didn't know how to process feelings. That sucks, but I don't, but there we are. And I don't think we live in the same world now. It's been yeah. 14 years. And so we, we happen to live in Massachusetts. We live in the same place we did then. And while I don't meet you know, polyamorous people every day on the street, loud and proud. I know for a fact that there are hundreds of people in my quiet little corner of Massachusetts. I'm not in Boston. I am in, you know, in this middle of nowhere place and there are hundreds of us all around. So now the trick is how do I let myself be out in a place where it is safe enough for the risk level I am able to tolerate? So Mm -hmm. It's such a personal question, but I wouldn't change a thing. And I guess um, by proxy of just being with me, you don't really get to be, (laughs) you don't get to hide anymore. Well, I have learned from the the trials and tribulations of those early days, years of our relationship that uh, even though those things happened, even though the community turned its back. It wasn't the fact that it turned its back on us that was the problem. It was absolutely the kids mm-hmm. yeah. because we're adults. And you're, and you're making that choice. Like you, you're making the choice. And the yeah. kids don't have that. Yep. Yeah, we could consent. Yeah. The kids couldn't. And so, but seeing all that, one of, the, one of the many, many things I learned is the damage that I did because I was silent. Yeah. Mm. Because I didn't um, bring up things that I thought were questionable. In, in my own life, with myself, with my partner, like everything. I just, like, that's, I don't, I don't believe in that anymore. Oh, because, too. So we, we then entered triad land, which meant we were up against couples privilege and we didn't know yeah. that word. Mm-hmm. Mm, so, yeah. you know, I, I joined their marriage, great big air quotes around that, mm-hmm. right? Like, I... We didn't have those words. We didn't know. So we went, I literally jumped out of the frying pan into the fire And, you know, here, when I think about someone coming out, I think, okay, first things first, start establishing vocabulary, shared meaning around that. And then you can start to make graduated risk decisions about what vocabulary are you going to use in the world? What will help you feel out and safe at the same time, depending on what your situation is? Um, And there there are so many great resources now that there weren't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I would, I would, I, we hesitate to often jump in and, and offer advice here, but there's a thought that came to mind while you were sharing this. And that is, I, I, I see, I think sometimes I worry that people, let's say one person is vehemently, I'm not going to sit in the closet. And the other one is, we have to stay in the closet. It's easy to pick children and say, well, you can't because of our child or because of our children. But I still think there is room to say, well, what are what can you do? And I think one of the really great things you can do is start building a community around you yeah. before you go and announce it to the world. So if if all of your monogamous friends or even all of your swinging friends turn their back on you and say, well, your kids can't play with my kids, you can say, well, I have this community of people where my kids still have friends, they, right. you know, it's, it is a way to sort of bolster yourself, hedge your bets against that and to build a community of people who understand you. And yeah. And I think, you know, so I identify as queer and, um, when I date, when I date women, um, I notice that they like, they're 
they're all used to that, like being careful around um, who they choose to be their friends so that their kids also have, Mm -hmm. you know, friends who won't just be zoinked from their life. Like, I don't think this is just a polyamorous issue. I think this is a swimming against the mainstream issue. And, you know, now if I were to go back and do this all over again, one of the things I would do is build community and strengthen the community I was in. I thought that community was strong. I was, I was at the center of that community. I thought it was very Mm -hmm. strong. And yet there were great big, um, errors in my own judgment. I mistook, um, familiarity for intimacy. And so there are things I would do to really bolster the strength of the community, the way that we count on each other and what it's okay to talk about. Because yeah, for instance, yeah. this wasn't about sex. Like mm-hmm. this particular yeah. instance, it might've been, but in fact it wasn't. I didn't even know whether I wanted that with him. I originally was like, I, I want to go for walks with you. I want to, I want to like read the same books you're reading and see what you, like, I was deeply interested in knowing this human. Yeah. Which wasn't any different from any of the things I was doing with my women friends. Um, So like there was a conflation of sex and intimacy that really needed to be sorted out. And I could have done that all in the years before. That conversation could have started years and years before if I'd known to have it. So I encourage those conversations all the time. Mm -hmm. Like talk about what intimacy means. I mean, I teach human sexuality. When I say that word, hey, is it okay for your partner to go on an intimate dinner with someone else? There's always at least a handful of kids who are outraged at the idea. Outraged at the idea that their partner would have an intimate dinner. Even before you've said what intimate means. And they don't ask the question, (laughs) right? right? Like what's intimate? So there are really baseline conversations that could have changed how the community functioned that might have made all of this go a completely different way. Yeah. Yeah. And for my, I think about my past and what I could have done different and it's kind of similar. Um, I would, I didn't have that kind of community, but I had, I had some relationships. They were kind of, um, casual with, with people in, in the area, but at no point did I have any conversation that was like authentic to me. I would Mm -hmm. just fit in and, and like, let them have the conversations they wanted. But if I had had, um, like conversations with people down the road, uh, there was like, so, you know, how, how are things going for you guys? What are your relationships like? How's, you know, what do what do you like? I don't know. Just actually got into who they actually were as people. They might've seen who I actually was as a people. Some of the things that if I got into some of the stuff that I hide and been like, here, here's a little something about me, then they would have seen past the cultural veneer and they wouldn't have been able to just brush off so so quickly. They would have been brushing off a more deeper connection. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I would try it anyway. Maybe it would have all come out the same, but I could at least say, well, they knew who I was. Yeah. Has, has that been something that you've adapted and changed since that point? In yeah. the way oh, no. That you, <laughs> 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 um, I mean... No, I think it's true. Yes, I have. I... I I enter into interactions with people in a different way. I mean, here I am on a podcast as I am weekly talking about all kinds of things and putting them out there. And a big part of the reason why is this because a life I, I feel absolutely 100% for myself that a life lived invisible, um, is bad for everybody. I don't want to do that. It's bad for me, and I think it's bad for the people around me because I might as well not be here. Mm-hmm. And you have to work against a like a, a really profound sense of introversion and and like mm-hmm. some and um you know a, an avoidant attachment style and like so he's working against those pressures internally, um, and I'm not. So for me to reinvent, it has been mostly about like oh, well I'm going to keep saying all these things. And I'm going to keep building the community the way I want. But mostly the thing that I do differently now is I treat um, not <laughs> I treat non-normativity as normal. Right. I assume yeah. that mm. people will be accepting and I stand there with all the privilege that I have, stand there in my community, which is a little red dot in a blue state, and say, this is me. I like, And this is my life. And that has been working very, very well. What we've found is that we're we aren't struggling with the same levels of prejudice that we 
were when we were trying to like over explain. Now we're just being yeah. a little bit louder, a little more clearer. <laughs> yeah. That's, and that's working better. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm curious too, how, I'm going to change the subject slightly. <laughs> I was trying to figure out if I should keep on that. But, you know, you mentioned you were in the triad for two and a half years and then that dissolved. And how was that transition then? Like, because it sounds like all of you were very much growing and learning and you've come so far in those 14 years, but like that transition and into the relationship that you're in now, which obviously I know is not like a one year transition or the, or the same one. It was right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, um, it was very eye opening to when, <clears throat> when I got divorced and she left. And so we were together. That didn't make as many things better as I thought it would. Um, because <clears throat> at core, my participation in the relationship was, it didn't change much. It turns out it wasn't the the back pressure of the difficulty of my relationship with my ex-wife so much as the uh, inept way I engaged in my relationship with Jolie. And, and so that became clear. It's like, oh, yeah. I have a lot of work to do. And I would love it if the thought was that clear, but it took years to really straighten out that this is how. Yeah. I mean, let, let's be like were. really, really frank mm-hmm. about it. Like she could operate as a scapegoat for right. problems in the relationship. So first it was me. First, I was the intruder in, in a like supposedly like an, from an outside looking monogamous relationship. I was the intruder. So I could be the scapegoat. And then she could become the scapegoat when things weren't working between them. They decided to get divorced and still stay together. We were all going to live together. And then, and then that was not tenable anymore, like real, real fast. Like there was just a few months and then that wasn't tenable. And yeah, like it's just a hot potato. It's a hot potato yeah. that nobody deserves. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't his fault. It was all of us together creating a relational dynamic that was not sustainable because we weren't able to really own our stuff and we kept passing that hot potato around. And until each person, until each adult was fully ready to take responsibility for their own learning on like, how was this going to work? Who are we? How are we going to show up? And then, and then together co-create something. It wasn't going to work. It didn't matter how many of us were left. Um, we almost broke up afterwards. We several times, several, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. And then, um, I told him he was an idiot and married him to prove it. No, (laughs) I, um, (laughs) That's no, that's a line from a movie, but it is very apt. It's a line from Mamma Mia. And every time it comes on, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's kind of true. I, when we got married, it was kind of a, it was like a, like thumbing our nose to ourselves. Like we didn't even know whether we were going to do it. Um, but it was, it was incredibly difficult. There was, so there's two and a half years as a triad. Then you've got another year four years of like just constant effort. We totaled it up at one point. We were seeing the same um, analyst for for several years. And um, I was keeping track of how many hours a week we were spending working on or talking about our relationship, like negotiating, working. It was, yeah, it was somewhere in the r- range of 35 to 40 hours a week. So yes. it was a full-time job. And that was without having any other long-term partners living with us. Because at the time we, we made a commitment to not live with anyone else, um, at that point, because both of us now had exes who were not warm to this polyamorous idea. So we were like, okay, in order to keep the kids safe-ish, you know, like from lawsuits and stuff, let's just keep this this way. (sighs) Years, years Mm -hmm. of trying to figure that out. And yeah. uh, Yep. Like you said, full-time job and maybe. I don't know if there was another way to do it. I mean, we started from. Well, I I do now. I feel like okay. there, yeah. Now there, yeah. If yeah, if there was another way, there is now. Well, there was there was another way, but we thought that the answer was in continually talking about how we felt. 
I don't know oh, about you, but yeah, you don't know us. <laughs> no, <you> don't. <laughs> so we, can't, we can't relate to this at all. <laughs> so that doesn't really work, which is actually why. So I, I have a master's in mental health counseling and I have a PhD in psychology. And I, when I looked around, when I turned and looked at like, okay, how do I help people? The answer wasn't in just listening to people talk about their feelings, which is why I don't practice in like regular mental health spaces. I practice as a coach because I I think we actually just kept digging our hole deeper yeah. by constantly talking about our feelings rather than learning how and then practicing how to do it differently. Yeah. How to break That's the it. things that so, we the habits and, that we had and the imagination, how to reimagine the whole thing. The I, listening and the talking about the feelings is a great first step. It's yeah. an important yeah. yep. it's an important thing. Essential. But you <laughs> yes, but but if you don't move beyond that, you're going to be stuck there. When we were yeah. on year seven, I was like, oh, you know what? This isn't working anymore. And yeah. that was actually the line in the sand. You can see it in our journals. You can see mm-hmm. like, oh, that's where it started to change. We'd done it long enough that you could see nothing changing. Oh, we're having the same conversation again. And at this point we're and married again. and we are like, this isn't going to work, is it? I don't think this is going to yeah. work. And that's when we knew something really, really had to change because we were talking about divorce. We were like, mm-hmm. okay, I guess this really, and we had really only signed the paper because well, the state privileges marriage and I needed insurance. Um, and, and so did my children. And so we had signed the paper and it was tempting to be like, yeah, you know what? Marriage, marriage is the problem. It's not, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's not, Mm, it wasn't marriage. We we didn't have the tools. We didn't have the skills. And we were not in a situation where we were actively encouraged to practice doing things in a non-normative way. So that's what we had to create. Yeah. And that's not to oh. say that you stop talking about your feelings. Oh, God, but right. you, I love you, you probably add some additional steps other than just that, right? right it's like, yeah. I'm going to go to the CrossFit gym and I'm only going to do push-ups, and I don't know why my legs aren't very strong, it's right? Like, <laughs> true story. Yeah. I, I love talking about feelings and I love, uh, we spend an enormous amount of time still talking about all of the, all of our insides. Well, they're an excellent doorway to how you can get at the things you might want to change. But we also mm-hmm. diversified it. We don't just talk about our feelings anymore. We talk about our, our nervous system regulation. We talk about our sensations. We talk about our imagination. We talk about our, our trauma histories. Now we're talking about a much more complex view of who we are and in our inner world. Mm-hmm. And that's very different from saying, I'm going to just continually talk about the feeling state that I have in this moment. Yep. And that has made it possible for us to see each other as, you know, yes, humans with wonderful emotions. I that feel are so angry. Luscious. Who in you feels angry? Right. But what else are you feeling? All of this, you know, getting really into complicated, the, the multiplicity. Yummy stuff. Mm-hmm. It's also less boring. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I think there's a piece in there that I will admit that was a revelation for me not that many years ago, two, two and a half, three years ago. And I'm sure I knew this on some level, but there was this part of me that was resistant to the fact that somebody might be different than me. Right. (laughs) And so the thing that I keep seeing, the thing when I look around and I see the world or when I feel a thing, that's probably not the same thing Emma feels when she sees that or when she experiences that. And I, that was new to me. There was just like, wow, people experience things different. People struggle with different things. And of course, yes, you kind of know that logically. But when you get into the heat of the moment and you're just like, why don't you do this? And it's because it doesn't register to me. And it's like, how can it not? Well, how does it register to you? And then you you have to start accepting that this other person is completely different than you. And they experience everything completely different than you. And so you have to understand their trauma, their feelings, their regulation, all of the stuff that you talked about because it's not the same as yours. But you have to be willing to accept that. Right. So you say that was uh, two and a half, three years ago. What do you think changed for you? How'd you get there? It actually almost happened live on this, not live, but recorded on the podcast. Mm-hmm. We were doing um, we were doing an interview with uh, Kelsia, who is part of Expansive Connection. She's a coach and she works a lot with the Enneagram. And so 
you know, there's a whole bunch of different personality tests. And, and we clearly now, after doing this episode, we've gotten some emails, from people like, they're like, that's just like your horoscope and it's all woo woo. And it's like, okay, maybe it is. That's fine. But if it's a tool to help me understand myself, I don't really care because it helps me understand myself. And actually it helped me understand that we are very different people, right? I'm a, I'm a one on the Enneagram and we'll link to those episodes and I'm as a nine and we are, could not be further apart in how we do certain things. And yet there are some things which we do very similar. And I think one, one thing that would happen is our similarities were similar enough that they would often camouflage our differences or yeah. they would camouflage them to me mm-hmm. where I would say, well, shit, we're damn near close on all of this, but there are these pieces we are, we, we aren't even on the same planet most of the time, mm-hmm. but I couldn't see that. Mm-hmm. And so it was this pretty big revelation where you're just like, holy shit, your whole world, you just realize that this person has a totally different personality style and right. way of doing things. And, you know, there, as Kelsey is sort of reading through the things that I experience and, and she's like, and it's probably, you have a voice in your head all day long that tells you everything you're doing is wrong. And, and I was like, yeah, doesn't everybody? And she's like, no. And I was like, well, what the fuck? Like, why, <laughs> why do I why have that? <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I was just thinking my whole life that everybody feels these things and, and maybe they're just ignoring it. And it's like, well, no, maybe some people just don't have that. And I'm like, well, that's not fair. Mm-hmm. And so there was a lot for me that came up in that. Again, whether it's total stardust makeup stuff, it allowed me to understand myself better and it allowed me to understand Emma better and other partners, family members. There's just so much that it gave me in terms of a tool for understanding that we're different. Yeah. And that was just about a year and a half ago. There you go. Nice. I, I think the, 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 the moment of discovering differentiation is like, yeah, I, I mean, I would love to notice it. I, so I have all these teenagers living with me and I feel like they're, you see glimpses of it. You see glimmers of when a teenager, especially one who's raised in a house where like psychology is talked about all the time, you see glimmers, <laughs> but it's also very clear. They can't, they can't hold on to it. Differentiation is difficult to bear. It's yeah. hard to hold. And, and it's still only one step. So I, all of my work around non-monogamy is around seeing non-monogamy as an individuation experience, which is actually like another layer beyond differentiation. There's this whole other like layer to what is possible. And without differentiation, you can't do it. Like that, mm-hmm. it, like it is so necessary. And non-monogamy is such a wonderful place to practice continual, ongoing, real life lab of I am not that person and yeah. they are not me. Okay. I am. I've got it. I'm not you. Wait, I'm not you. Uh, uh, Forgot again. Who am I now? It's the comfort. It's the comfort and security yeah. that, so that, that can provide. The and, sense uh, of belonging. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's like a warm bath. We're just to enmesh, the same. <sighs> enmeshing is a warm right. bath. That yeah. is totally what it felt like to fall in. When I say I fell in love with him, I'm like, no, no, no. I projected all she my golden all shadow. Kinds of happy projections all on over him. And, and I was like, oh, we're the same. This is perfect. And nothing could be further from the Spoiler, truth. And I'm an eight and he's a two. So no, you're <laughs> five. I'm an eight. No, no, we're not the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, but... Well, and even if you were the same Enneagram number, by oh. the way, there's still like there's plenty of room. <laughs> there's yeah. plenty of room for differences big, in there too. What's your big five? What's your mi- Brian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, let's. We, it's yeah. a starting point for language and understanding. Right. Yeah, and it doesn't. It's not like we're fixed either. I've been doing so much nervous system regulation work over the last um, couple of years, and I'm not the same. I'm yeah. I, like my my physiology is shifting, which means my my feeling states are shifting. I am not the same person I was and neither are you. He's no, also I been mean, doing the same work. And, and oh. you mentioned me as being, you know, struggling with introversion and all this. And it's pretty clear that, no, I'm a terrified extrovert. It's not the same thing. Yeah. He's a dysregulated extrovert. Yeah. Which a dysregulated the same thing extrovert. extrovert. I love talking to people. I get fed so much by being with people when I'm not absolutely terrified of them. And when I'm not, it's, it's magic. Yeah. But I spent so much time thinking I'm introverted, I'm closed up, I'm not going to stay away from me, I hate people, grr. So now I get the joy totally of not. learning to acknowledge him as an extrovert 
where I've been labeling him as an introvert all these years. So that'll probably take another five or six years. I would think. <laughs> I was gonna I say that, <laughs> that was my next question of like, what are some challenges that you're like working through now? Yeah. I mean, continual work on, on, on not accidentally enmeshing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, oh yeah. my God. Just, yep. it's just too easy. And, and we, it's so we hard. Live we're together, surrounded we're by together. all these children who actually do a pretty good job of not seeing us as a unit because they reasons, but still <laughs> we hold a similar role. And so it can be hard, you know, that there's one more pressure to squeeze us together. Yeah. And then there's what you were saying, the warm bath of, um, of enmeshment. Yeah. Let's just, and we just renegotiated. Um, so we have lived 24 seven power dynamics before. Um, mm-hmm. so from the BDSM King world, um, and we're both switches, but we just, we just renegotiated our power dynamic, like in the last couple of weeks and like, you know, in, in a huge learn there. way. And so in some ways I feel like we just completely got like, it's, it is a new marriage. Everything mm-hmm. just shifted mm-hmm. yep. because we renegotiated, even though from the outside, nobody would really notice anything, but I it literally, I actually have new relationship energy again. Um, my friends can't stand it. They're like, oh my God, could you shut up? We've known him a long time. <laughs> like, I get it, but you don't understand. Yeah. It's, it's full on NRE because of that. So yeah, plenty to work through. And one of the challenges I have there and I, I, yeah, your description of it's a new marriage. It is. And one of the struggles is to not slip back into one of the old ones. Yeah. Um, they're familiar. Yeah. They give me a, what feels like a safe place to go in a moment of confusion or strife. It's not, but it feels like one. And so hanging on to today for mm-hmm. me is, mm-hmm. uh, it's one of the challenges. Yeah. So I have a question that will, it's the inverse of that question, but I'm going to ask it in a critical way. And that way is, why the hell do you keep doing this if it's so damn hard? <laughs> oh. It's funny. That, uh, yeah, I can totally see where that question comes from. And contained in it is the assumption that hard is bad. Yeah. And I get it because, I mean, I've, I live in this world. I understand all the messages that we get. Um, but it isn't, it's, it, like, it has no internal validity. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with hard? Yeah, we pick up heavy things too. Right? Um, every Everybody does, well, okay, the, the reason, the simple answer, because it's fun. Yeah. Why do we? Why does anybody do hard things? Because it's fun or it gets us closer to where we want to be. Yeah. And, I, and for me, like I, um, I always ask people, do you, do you come at your polyamory or your non-monogamy? Do you come at it as a relation, an orientation, a philosophy or a choice? I don't mm-hmm. care which, but like, just let me know. And for both of us, um, we feel it's an endemic quality of us. We can practice the, the, the practices of monogamy very easily. The pandemic was super easy for us. Um, we weren't seeing anybody cause I had just finished up um, my dissertation. We weren't seeing anybody. So we were like, eh, this is fine. It was easy. It's fine, but it's not true. So yeah. it, to some level, yeah. it's just because it doesn't actually matter who we're seeing uh, at any given moment. We're just not monogamous people and neither I'm probably closer to being able to make a monogamous commitment. Um, I, I can't even imagine you doing that. It feels like it would just be asking you to like be a different, like a different species of person. I I would. Okay. Okay. I promise to not let you do things you like. Nope, can't do it. <laughs> yeah, which is funny because I date way more than he does. Like, I am very slutty, but I don't, yeah, like, it, I it have just, another, it's just you. I have another answer for the question. Go it's for it. A, a slightly friendlier one, I think. So, um, although I do come at my relationships from an endemically polyamorous point of view, nonetheless, I lived a big chunk of my life in the monogamous mindset, in monogamous relationships, they're no less hard. But the hard that I had, that I remember from those relationships didn't go anywhere. It was just always hard. These hard things lead to something new every time. Every time something hard comes up, when it's resolved, there's something new there. It's very creative. I love that. 
Mm-hmm. Well, That's and a beautiful it, answer. Uh, yeah, it is, and I and there was a piece in there that I was thinking about, which is the, and it's not necessarily a question per se, but it's the idea that many of the problems, quote unquote problems, many of the things you two have worked through or that we've worked through, those were going to be there whether we were monogamous or non-monogamous or any of it. I think for for my my own perspective is non-monogamy forced me in some ways to confront things that we would often we would come at, we would see them and we would go, that's gross. Put that away. I don't want to look at that again for a while. And, and then we could do that and we could put it away. We'd put it on the back burner, put it in the closet and we don't touch it for a year or two. And then it comes up again and it's probably a little worse and we're even more scared of it. And we put it deeper in the closet, but they don't, we never actually worked through so many of those things. We were just often striving for easy what's going to make today frictionless versus Mm -hmm. what's going to make our relationship actually better tomorrow and the day after and next year. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. The non-monogamy closets all have glass doors. (laughs) We'll just put this away and still see it. (laughs) Still see it. It's still there. It's still there. And it's, and it just fell through the door and now there's glass no, on the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm, I'm like, relationships are messy, but it is good news because orderly, I don't see orderly actually working out in my clients' lives day to day. It, it just, it, it, it isn't. If that, yeah. It's, it's not, people aren't happy there. Right. If I, if I were seeing something else, I would be less concerned, but Yeah. Well, in good, I mean, in this day and age, maybe, you know, 50 years ago, you could create some order because you leave work, you go home, nobody can contact you, nobody's going to bother you, you're going to sit on the couch with your partner, and the world is largely shut out. And here, good luck creating some stability. You, you're like, hey, I just cleared my entire to do list. Ding. Like, well, son of a bitch, there's something well, new. <laughs> you know what, though? That said, I, when we, when we first like came barging out of whatever closet I might have been in, um, I the thing that I I would say to people like I'm in love with two people or you know we're we're non monogamous whatever I would use whatever language and I was met time after time after time here it is with that never works that <laughs> never works that never works that never works it took me about six months to ask a very critical question which is. <laughs> really tell me how, how do you know? (laughs) All of a sudden the stories came out of the woodwork very quietly. Only when I had people one-to-one that they'd all already been there and they'd tried it. And in their isolated imaginations, since they had failed or they'd watched their sister fail or they'd like whatever failed, they'd experienced pain and isolation in their attempts at non-monogamy, then that never works. So what if we get a little bit clearer about what it means for our relationship to work and what it means to come out and actually say this stuff to each other? Because once I started having those conversations, it was really easy. People would say, that never works. And as soon as I asked them, tell me more about what you know about it, really generative conversations happened. Well, it's that's a very rich phrase. All three words you can dig into. Yeah. What do you mean that? What do you mean never? What do you mean by works? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, That's a very good point. Yeah. Totally. Every, every single one of them. And, and that was a much nicer ask than I would have. I think the common ask is, well, tell me about your monogamous relationship and how well that worked. Right. And there's statistics there that can tell you that at least 50% of those don't quote unquote work. But how do you define work? Yeah, that's how, so when I was um, writing my dissertation, I, I had a hard time finding a committee chair. Mm-hmm. And when I would ask the core faculty, I would be met with like, oh, but like that, that doesn't work. Or don't you think they're like, they're just or whatever. And that was what I would ask them. These, these brilliant critical thinkers, I would say like, well, tell me what you mean by having it work because the data is telling us that monogamy doesn't work by your own definition. Mm-hmm. I got my committee chair real fast after I started asking that question because good because when faced with the actual information, somebody's going to have to sign up for this, or we're all going to have to explain ourselves. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> it was good though. It was good. I like when people respond to a reasonable question with a reasonable answer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
So what does it mean to each of you for a relationship to work? For me, it just means that I'm allowed to prioritize growth, even if that is not comfortable for my partner. Yep. That's the word that came up. Growth. Growth toward being more of who I think I can be. So individuation. Individuation. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Amazing. Can you please both come back on soon? Because this was such a wonderful (laughs) conversation. And I also feel like we... We have lots to talk about around the kink and BDSM dynamic between you two. <laughs> yeah, we didn't even touch on that. There is so much, and I'm just so grateful that this was. Yeah. This was amazing. This yeah, was amazing. We could, fun. Thank you. Yeah. Have so, so many much. more questions, but yeah, thank you. we'll we'll uh, respect your uh, yes. evening. It's your evening. <laughs> it's your evening, and just want to you're thank proselytizing you both. to do in the <laughs> we, state of Massachusetts. That's exactly. So we yeah, we got to get mm-hmm. back yeah. out there. You got to get door to door. Door to door, knocking on the door. Spread the word. <laughs> Before we let you go, do you mind uh, letting listeners know? Obviously, links will be in the show notes, but where the best place to find you? Yep, yeah, the no. easiest place to find both of us is on our podcast, Playing With Fire. Um, if you just type Playing With Fire into your podcast player, you'll see we're a yellow cover with a blue mm-hmm. flame. And um, if you want to follow me, you can find me at Dr. Jolie underscore Hamilton on pretty much any social media you'd like to find me at. Or Joe yeah. Hamilton.com. Yeah, I'm kind of everywhere. Well, and we'll definitely put links. But I, Julian, would you also be willing to talk a little bit about your coaching work, who, who you typically work with, and what what that experience is often like? And, and also, Ken, if you have other work you would like to promote, we want to make sure you both have time. Yeah. So Ken is working with me these days, which is fantastic for me and for my groups. So I work with people individually, but my individual work is it's it's pretty extensive. I go, I deep dive with people. It's a big investment. But recently we created a group program together and that group stays together for a year. So it is aptly called the year of opening. Um, it's for people who are figuring out how to transition from a mono paradigm to a non mono paradigm or a paradigm of multiplicity. And Ken's there with me. I have formed the curriculum. It's all based on my, my research. It's based on years of working with clients. But Ken's in the room having all of this experience and also having been socialized in a yeah. different way than yep. I was. I, I bring the, the <laughs> socialized boy perspective and also uh, to, well, it colors my thinking a lot. So a very uh, scientific physics type perspective on how all this stuff makes sense to me, which can be helped. So another way of thinking about it and talking about yeah. it. Yeah. And we meet together for a year. And one of the things I love about that is it, um, it allows each cohort to come together and form a community together. They're small. They're less than, they're 20 people or less and they're together for a whole year. And sometimes they've been open for a long time and sometimes they're just making the transition, but it's hard to make that shift in your, in your psyche from mono everything to multiplicity everything. And that's what I specialize in. That's what I love. I love stretching the imagination. So you can find out about that at um, theyearofopening.com. And tell them about your quiz. Oh, or you could go to jolyquiz.com. I have so many. I have so many dot coms at this point. Well, that's a fun one. The, I like that Jolie one. Quiz, J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z is where um, I took my research and turned it into a quiz to find out where are you on the Oh, hell yeah. Get me started. I am so ready to open all the way over to the, oh my gosh, we are so not ready. This is not for us. Because you got to figure out where you are to know where you should get started. It might be time for you to listen to a podcast or read a book, or it might be time for you to join a group, or it might be time for you to see a counselor. All answers are good, but Mm -hmm. it's good to know where you are right now. I love it. Yeah. Well, again, links will to everything will be in the show notes for everybody. And I I think, too, it's important to have somebody in your group who tells everybody that they're idiots because that's how they learn. See? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) This is why we keep Um, them around. Maybe maybe he's telling the people in your cohort that everybody else is idiots and that that they should worry about. And that they're special. What's been fun about that is turning it around and realizing I'm just as much of an idiot as everybody else. And isn't that the worst? A little bit bit more. (laughs) I may have exceeded a little bit. He's an overachiever. Yeah. Yeah. I got a game. Wow. (laughs) Self-awareness is the first step. Yes. That's right. It's true. I love it. Well, yeah. Thank Thank you both. Yes. Thank you both so much for this wonderful, just like rich conversation. And we really appreciate your time and 
enjoy the rest of your day and uh yeah thank you again thank Thanks you so much for having us and, and we're, we're back. back oh same time nailed it crushed it Poof. <laughs> for anyone who can't see us like everyone listening we just fist bumped yeah it was good <laughs> it was a good one thank you jolie and ken for all of the work that you do and for coming out and sharing your story we had an absolute blast talking to you and are excited to just keep in touch and to spread the word yeah and again just a reminder all of the links to all of the things that jolie and ken talked about are in our podcast player show notes or I'm sorry, not in the podcast player show notes, on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. And I just wanted to also echo Emma's gratitude to Jolie and Ken for coming on, sharing, and also we're going on their podcast. We are. So stay tuned for that fun recording, which <laughs> which I don't know when it'll be out, but when it is, I'm sure you will know about it. Yes. And quick reminders, if you're looking for community we would love for you to check out our community on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. And we're launching weekly groups. All the information is also listed on our website. And next week, we have an amazingly hilarious and fun interview with Liana, who, well, we'll just say is amazing. <laughs> yes. And by her own words, severely gay. <laughs> this will come up at least once in our conversation. At least once. And it is a riot and it is fun. So we will see all of you in a week. But until then, I think, hey, there's a holiday between now and then. There is in the U.S. In the U.S. And that holiday is Finn's birthday. It is. So we are <laughs> celebrating. You should celebrate as well. Enjoy the fireworks if you're in the U.S. And with that, we'll see everyone in a week. We will. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs>